minus three four. All right. Let's make sure we're navigated in the right places. Okay. And for the attendees that are on Zoom, if you can hear and see what's going on, if one of you, if any of you could just raise your hand just to make sure that we are fully connected. Thank you, Kirsten, I appreciate that. Hopefully that goes for everyone. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Oh, I'll wait till Marcel so she can click on the Marcella, will you click got it on? Will you click got it on the computer over there on the screen? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we kind of already went through our agenda for today. No, it doesn't want to work. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen from here. All right. Okay, so we've already went kind of went through our agenda for today in regards to our welcome and introductions um, and our tech tips. Um, as you all know, we have our meetings here, so the bathrooms are out here to the right to my right. Um, for any of you that um, may need to. Um, and then as far as our training format, today we are doing a hybrid setup for our uh, training. So we have participants that are online and of course you all here in person. Um, we will go through a set of information and offer an opportunity for you, any of you who may have training, I mean, may have questions. Um, we'll go through our training, we'll do a questions and answer session, and then there are some acknowledgement forms that I'll have you all fill out and um, turn in before you depart for today. So first starting off, just a brief uh, review of why our commissions exist in the first place. And this is an opportunity for you as um, citizens and residents of this great city to be involved in local government, in a way that um, allows you to um, have your hand at leadership within our community. Um, we also use our commissions to assist in the city council's effort to implement the city's strategic plan, to receive uh, public input, and to be the state or local hearing body, um, and to convene a com convocation or a convention of stakeholders, um, which you all are as a part of this um, community. So just briefly, our vision and our mission as an organization, um, which trickles down to our roles in boards and commissions and committees. Our vision is that Seaside is a vibrant, proudly diverse, energetic, and safe community with extraordinary natural beauty, quality of life and economic opportunities. And our mission is simply to just include, innovate and inspire. The council has five, um, back in November, the city council conducted a strategic planning session in which they reviewed their plans, goals, objectives over the last few years and narrowed down five different categories that they would like to focus on um, in their effort as they lead our city. And those categories were effective, accessible governance, vibrant local economy, diverse and inclusive community, enhanced physical infrastructure and abundant water supply, community safety and quality. And I realize that these words don't have a lot of definite meaning. What they are are a concept in which the work that the direct staff to do and the work of the commission carries out to lead to these aspirational goals um, that they have and they see for our city. 
And so that is done through our boards and commissions. We have several active boards and commissions. Many of you representing tonight, if you hear the name of your commission called, if you would just raise your hand so we just know uh, what body you're from. We have Art and History, Neighborhood Improvement Commission, Community Safety Advisory Commission, Parks and Recreation, Water Allocation Committee, Homeless Commission, Community Development Advisory Commission, no? Planning Commission, Environmental Commission, Traffic Advisory Committee, and C Jobs, which is the Commission on Jobs, Opportunities, and Businesses in Seaside. So those are our active uh, commissions and committees that we currently have here with the city. So each of the commissions and the committees have a certain charge or a mission that, that is their purview um, to assist the, the city council in uh, making decisions uh, regarding that particular topic. So in the municipal code, um, chapter 2.14 defines the mission for each board commission and committee. And so I would definitely encourage you to visit our website, find the municipal code, look up the chapter for your particular committee or commission and see exactly what it is that your charge or your mission is for your particular commission, because that will help define um, that mission defines the items that you see on your agendas um, in your annual work plans and how it lines up with um, the, the city's strategic plan. And we have a new way of doing that this year um, going forward, but we'll go over that in a, in a little while. Um, Dominique, I just wanted to add um, that second slide where it says advisory versus legislative. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of um, commissions that we have inside the city that actually make um, first line decisions. And those two committees are the Neighborhood Improvement Commission with respect to declaring public nuisances. And there are some special rules that you have to follow when you're making those kinds of decisions. Um, and the Planning Commission who is charged by state law to weigh in on planning and zoning laws and to make recommendations and also to make decisions under our municipal code. So those are the two commissions that have some additional duties above and beyond the normal advisory role that many of our commissions have. Yes, definitely. So there is a distinction um, between those two and Sherry laid that out very nicely, thank you. All right, so then we have our commissions, we have our committees, we know how what their, their missions or their charge um, is for their work. Um, but getting started is starts with the appointment process. And the appointments for uh, boards and commission is um, under the care of the mayor of Seaside. Um, and that is within our municipal code uh, that calls for the mayor to uh, make appointments um, of community members to the different boards, commissions, and committees within the city. Um, and that is typically uh, done with, um, in conjunction with a city council subcommittee um, or Mayor Pro Tem <laughs> is the other person who is involved in making those appointments and that decision making um, that gets recommended to the council. So the process is simple that you guys have all have went through. Um, you submit your application, we review it, you go to an interview with the mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, it gets placed on a council agenda. Um, and if it's approved, then you are appointed. Then you'll receive a nice long letter from me telling you have to do two hours of ethics training and all these things and also be here today. Um, as far as filling um, application, filling appointment vacancies, um, there's a few different ways that we go about uh, making sure that we are able to fill the vacancies of our commissions and committees. We have definitely the application process. Um, if a individual applies for a commission that does not have a vacancy, the, the application is kept on file for two years with the city clerk's office. And if a vacancy opens up within that time frame, then they would be offered the opportunity to interview or to see if they would still want to go forward with being appointed. Um, also, recommendations, especially from um, existing commissioners or committee members, is definitely a way that we get the word out um, and get like-minded folks um, and a diverse and diverse uh, ways of thinking and representations of our community. Um, and then there are some um, limitations as far as appointment. One, mostly being that you must be 
a seaside resident, there are some exemptions um, in regards to the appointments um, that allow for someone outside the city, especially if it's um, particular to a, a role. Um, we used to have, before it was merged into our planning commission, had the Board of Architectural Review, uh, which required an architect. Uh, but if there's not one that lives in Seaside, then it would be permissible for someone outside of the city, hopefully as close as possible, um, that could be appointed to that particular um, board. And then holding incompatible offices. So if you are currently an appointed member on a board of commission, and you become an elected official, um, let's say you get elected to the city council, that would be an incompatible office. Whichever office you hold first is the one that you would automatically forfeit upon accepting um, the placement of an elected seat. And on that, if you ever have any questions about that, you can always either call Dominique or you can call me to talk it through on whether or not you have a conflict. And I will tell you, I have written memos on incompatibility of office where somebody got appointed to the planning commission when the BAR was eliminated, when the Board of Architectural Review was eliminated and they held an elected seat someplace else. And they were a little upset because they didn't realize that if they had accepted and been sworn in, they would have lost their elected seat because of an incompatibility of office. So can be an important um, issue if you're out there running on other boards and commissions. Yes. I'll go back to that slide. Were there any questions up until that with the information that we've reviewed so far? Um, if you have a question, if you would just raise your hand, Maricela will come over with the microphone because unfortunately the folks on Zoom won't be able to hear your question if you're not speaking into a microphone. Are there any questions that you have so far? I have a lot of questions. I don't think I need the microphone. We, we actually are recording this, so you have to actually speak into oh, the mic. Yeah. Okay. And also the people on Zoom need that extra little oomph. Okay. Sherry, when you were talking about the incompatible offices, that's any commission or is it just here in Seaside? Is it like, you know, if you... I mean, just for example, if you were on the Coastal Commission or something, would that be incompatible? Yeah, it's actually, it can be a very complicated analysis. But for example, if you are appointed to the Planning Commission, you're making rulings on land use decisions at, that might affect you. And let's say you were on the school board that is located in Seaside, and they make different kinds of decisions. So if the, the decisions would conflict, it means you have two masters. Are you gonna follow the school district or are you gonna follow the planning commission? I and mean, that's kind of the essence is you only are allowed to have one master, one loyalty to the group. And that's when you get to those incompatibility of offices. Um, but it's more like an airport land use commission and planning commission or a, um, if you were on a, uh, I'm trying to think of another good example. The Coastal Commission. The right? Coastal Commission could be one. Yeah. yeah. If hmm? water management. Maybe if you're on the water management district making some water decisions and uh, on the planning commission making rulings or recommendations on applications for water within the seaside, that could be an issue. Um, it can get really complicated. So I'd encourage you, if you're ever in that situation, just pick up the phone, give me a call, give Dominique a call. We're both pretty accessible in terms of getting the information and getting back to you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, you have another question over here, Marcella. Thank you, Ms. Damon. Um, just for clarity, I just uh, want to make sure that 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 um, and to your last point that I got this right. That if if a person has uh, a, a position with an agency in which Seaside does not have a seat at the table, then then that doesn't come into play if they get elected to to the city council. Let's say, for example, they have a they have a 
a, a position in the city in the, in the county of San Benito, some some agency that in which Seaside doesn't have a seat at the table. Is that different or? It could be different. It, it could be different. So like, for example, you know that many of our city council members belong to other boards and commissions, like, for example, the mayor pro tem also sits on the uh, Joint Powers Authority for the Laguna Grande Park uh, area, um, which is an agency of Seaside and Monterey. And that is not an incompatible office where you get to incompatibility of offices is where um, you're ruling on something like you're on an airport land use commission, you're on a planning commission, it, it could raise an incompatibility if you're on water management district, you're, you're ruling on something that is also within the jurisdiction of whatever body you're on and whatever decision you're making on the commission here in Seaside. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. All right. All right. So now that you're, you know, why the commissions exist, how they get appointed, then you get onto your commission and there are officers for your uh, commissions, typically, which consists of a chair and a vice chair. Your, your chair and your vice chair serve a term of one year and it is a calendar year. Um, so from January to December. So your first meeting of the new year, you should be electing your um, your chair and your vice chair. Um, and that is conducting, you know, conducted at the beginning of the year. So there is on your, on the next page, on uh, page 11 in your handbook, it talks about the roles, responsibilities of um, the chairperson, members, the liaison, and the commission administration. So I'll kind of go through those uh, for you as well. But in your um, handbook, it talks about your responsibilities. And one of the main things that you wanna remember about your uh, responsibility as a committee or commissioner is that you really have to familiarize yourself with the laws that are governing um, your particular commission, which for us would be the Seaside Municipal Code um, on, in addition to any others that may be applicable for your particular commission and committee. Um, we have a question. My voice is loud too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you said page 11, but these Things you passed out don't have any number of pages on them. So that was my question. Okay, that's one of my updates. <laughs> oh, okay. So we had to count. Yes, it's, okay. it, yes, it's, it's what it says getting started. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry about that. So it's, um, so the responsibilities are one, starting off knowing the laws that are governing um, your particular commission, starting off with the Seaside uh, Municipal Code, and that's in chapter 2.14, as um, we talked about earlier, where your missions are also located. Um, being prepared for your meetings. Um, you're representing uh, both the city and the public's interest in your um, role as a committee or a commissioner. So understanding what's on your agenda, reading the agenda packet, um, you know, inquiring on any concerns or issues or questions that you might have in regards to the information that's provided to you in advance is definitely helpful, not only for yourself, but for your uh, liaison so that they might have a prepared answer or response for you by the time your meeting comes around. Um, also the responsibilities or roles of the liaison and the committee administration. Each commission will have a staff liaison and typically a commission clerk that would be assigned from staff that would be responsible for actually making sure that your agenda is published and um, generating any reports or uh, anything that's on the agenda itself. Um, but they are your resource um, and your connection um, to the city staff to the city staff in regards to information or inquiries uh, that you might have. They also help 
with uh, maintaining uh, the rules and making sure that you all have the resources that you need in order to govern in your respective roles and on your commission. Um, also, there is um, an adherence to policy um, that you want to pay special attention to in regards to ensuring that the projects, the items and things that you have on your agenda are not in um, direct uh, violation or incompatible with the stance of the city council or the city in general. So ensuring that those things are uh, really, um, you really stick to them um, in that regard will really make sure that you're um, being as effective as you possibly can uh, with your um, commission so that you don't have any issues of uh, decisions being turned around or the um, advisory role is no law or the advisory or the recommendations um, aren't able to be uh, transmitted or elevated to that of the city council. You want to be able to make decisions that stick and that you can get some traction to and get some you know action, whatever the city council decides, but we want to make sure that it actually gets to them in order for them to have um, that decision. Did you have something? No. All right. And then also, I just wanted to go over uh, the uh, resignations as well. Um, if you have any, if you have a res, if you decide that you need to resign before the end of your term, that you're, you just have to send in, you know, notice to your staff liaison. They transmit that to the city clerk so that we can update our vacancies and, and do recruitment for that as well. And then there's also a clause for removal from office. Um, some particular, some commissions or committees have their own particular rules written into their particular portion of the ordinance um, that um, they are to abide by. But in general, um, for removal of office, there are certain steps that have to be taken in order for that um, to go through. And then also, as a commissioner, you do have the ability, um, I haven't gotten any requests recently, but you do have the ability to request business cards um, from the city clerk's office if you're interested. They typically hold your, um, the na your name, the name of your commission, um, and some contact information that you select um, to be placed on there. So if you are interested, just uh, let us know, and we'll make sure that you get um, your business cards. And then also as a commission, you will have your annual work plans. Um, each year, each commission is to develop their work plan. One of the things that is different about this year than previous years is that we have a strategic plan in which um, your work plans are aligned with. And then the budget that comes out for the city is then aligned with it as well. That allows there to be a fiscal um, assignment for each of the goals and um, the different objectives that come up. Those work plans are, once they're final with your commission, are a draft to the city council in which they will amend um, accordingly to uh, line up with their strategic plan. And then that way there is a full harmony across from our city council to our commissions and the city staff understand um, and can acknowledge the um, things that they need to implement in order to, to move it forward. Are there any questions about the getting started and the roles and responsibilities before we move on to the next topic? I do have another question. Okay. Sorry. So is it our city clerk that um, we provide the information and our city clerk does up our, our annual work plan? Or is it our chair or a vice chair that's doing that? Is that their obligation? It would be that of the chair and, and the vice chair in coordination with their, um, with the staff liaison. Okay. And then that document is transmitted to the city clerk. I, um, I think that's an entire committee yes. uh, issue. So what the, the actual process is, you're working with your staff liaison, the chair, and the vice chair of your committee would work with staff liaison to get the city's 
strategic plan, and then you would work as a committee or commission to work on what elements go in that strategic, your strategic work plan, if you will. So, and then the staff liaison should be able to provide you with some feedback about whether or not what you want to do as a board or commission, how that fits into the city's overall strategic plan. So by doing it that way, and then once you're done with it, it gets referred up the chain as your work plan, at your commission's work plan. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, perfect. Thank you for that clarification. Um, yes, it is a whole committee effort um, <coughs> to, to, to get that through. I was just checking this to make sure we didn't have anybody on Zoom. Is there anyone on Zoom who has any questions? If you wanna use the raise your hand feature or dial star nine, if you're calling from the phone, we can take any questions that you might have as well. None, okay. All right. All right. We were going to do a role play, but it's in the wrong place. Sorry. I so we're going to go. One more oh, question. Go, oh, go ahead. Um, do, is there any? Can we? Do we? Uh, are these on file? Can we look at past ones that were submitted for our commission just to see what they look like? Sure. These, uh, annual work plans. Do if I emailed you, would you be able to send me? One? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. All right. So this portion, I'm going to turn over to our wonderful city attorney. Um, who's going to go through code of ethics. All righty then, let's talk about ethics a little bit. So um, members of the city council, um, there are key positions inside the city. We all have to abide by a certain code of ethics. And this is not a technical thing, but it's um, somewhat of a guidance to how we should act when we're acting in the public interest. So. We should act in the public interest. And that seems like it makes a whole lot of sense. We work for the common good of the people in Seaside and not for our private or personal interest. And uh, we ensure fair and equal treatment of everybody um, that comes before our border commission. That's pretty straightforward, I think. Um, we try to comply with the spirit and the letter of the law and city policy, and that's state law and city law. Um, the nation, the state, the city, and we in carrying out our duties. So, you know, we want to be sensitive in that. That's kind of common sense, I think. Um, conduct of our members, you know, we should refrain from abusive conduct. Personal charges or verbal attacks should maintain a certain sense of decorum in our interactions on a commission. Try not to argue on, on the commission. Um, be civil with each other. Let you let each person finish their um, thoughts and their statements. Refrain from any attack on the character or motives of other members of the council or the boards or the commissions, um, staff or public. Just keep it keep it high level in terms of um, that conduct as we're conducting business in the public. Um, respect for the process. It's sometimes hard to respect a process, but you are part of the process. Each board and commission is part of the process. And so as you're discharging your duties that Dominique was, our city clerk was talking about earlier in terms of being prepared, reading your packet, all of those things that we do to get ready for a board or commission meeting, that's, that's part of respecting the process. So you wanna make sure you're prepared and ready to go. Um, the chair has a big duty for conduct at public meetings. Um, listen courteous, courteously, attentively, and the chair is going to guide how that happens. The chair of your board or commission is really helping to ensure that that um, conduct at the public meeting is, is followed, that each commissioner is is doing what they're supposed to do, that the public gets to participate appropriately. Um, and you just focus on the item and the business at hand. Uh, decisions based on merit. 
um, basing your decisions on the merits and the substance of the matter at hand rather than on unrelated considerations. So try to really just stick on topic and communications. Um, try, there are two kinds of um, hearings that we perform on our boards and commissions. Most of the boards, as was discussed earlier, are, adjudic are um, advisory commissions. And in those, you definitely want the public input and um, you want to ref you know, refrain from receiving input outside, but it's less important. You can get and solicit input from outside those um, advisory bodies where the two commissions that have an issue are in the planning commission and in the neighborhood improvement commission and specifically with respect to adjudicative matters where you're the planning commission for example makes a ruling on an application for a house let's just say that is an adjudicative matter once they are done with their decision they're going to let that applicant know that or the people who are opposed to the application that they have the right to appeal and it goes up to the city council. Those are very specific types of hearings and you have to be extremely careful what information you hear about from the outside. You need to really focus on um, keeping your information based on your staff report and the information that's presented to you at that hearing. It is a formal hearing. Think about it like a court hearing a little bit. You wouldn't want a judge to say, oh, you know, I heard from uh, Will that uh, your case has no merit. I mean, we would be completely offended by that, right? If we showed up in a court case. Uh, and the same thing is true in an adjudicatory hearing. You are acting like a judge on the, the matter. So you can solicit advice from city attorney. Sometimes I give good advice. <laughs> I always give good advice. <laughs> I always give good. Um, if you have a conflict or somebody has talked to you, sometimes you will see a hearing where the applicant may have called you up and tried to talk to you about their application. Um, standard rule is, you know, it's always better not to have that conversation because you you don't want to be in a conflict position. But if you happen to have that conversation, it's not illegal to have that conversation. Um, you should publicly disclose that you had that conversation. So there's no appearance of any kind of impropriety, um, no under the table deal being made, nothing like that. So really it's above board decisions made in public. Gifts and favors. Do not take the dollar bill. That was a joke. Come on, you guys. <laughs> the attorney doesn't doesn't do jokes very well, but there you go. Dollar bill right there. Um, refrain from accepting any gifts, favors, promises, or future benefits, which could compromise your independence um, or judgment or action, or give the appearance of being compromised. It is really important that you're representing the public in the on each board in commission. Confidential information. Um, members must maintain confidential confidentiality of all written materials and verbal information provided to members, which is confidential or privileged. That doesn't happen too often in our advisory committees. You don't really have like a closed session because you're not involved in litigation or real estate negotiations or any of the kinds of things usually that are a part of uh, confidential information, but you might get some information from time to time that might be proprietary, but your staff uh, liaisons and the staff who are presenting to you should be advising you if there is a piece of information that is confidential that maybe you need to consider or you need to look at um, as part of the decision-making process. Use of public resources you shall not use, you shall not use public resources which are not available to the public in general. Example, don't use staff time. You don't get, you know, staff are not your personal worker bees out there 
you don't get to go use the copier to copy, you know, the uh, flyer for your private whatever, right? Um, supplies or facilities, you can't do it for private gain or personal purposes or anything not otherwise authorized by law. So for the most part, your staff liaison is your key to the resources and the things that your committee or commission might need. Representation of private interest, that is precluded. We don't, the boards and commissions should be acting in the public interest. So advocating for something that's in a private interest um, of third parties on matters that are in areas that you, your board or commission makes a decision on is precluded. That is um, something that is not um, ethical under our um, rules of e ethics. Um, advocacy um, always represent the official policies or positions of the board or commission to the best of your ability as you understand them when, and when designated as delegates for this purpose. So let's just say somebody at the uh, planning commission is selected to appear before the city council. You don't stand up and say, hi, I'm, I'm here to advocate on behalf of myself for the whatever you say, I'm here as a representative of the planning commission. I'm here as a representative of the arts and history commission or the neighborhood improvement commission. Um, and you explicitly must state if you appear and you are not appearing for your board or commission, hi, I'm a member of the planning commission, but I am here in my individual capacity to offer my own private comments to you on this matter. Something along the lines of that. Just wanna make it really clear in your mind as you are, and to the public and to everybody else, are you speaking on behalf of your official duty or in your private interest? Um, and it's inappropriate to try to use your position for gain. You can't leave the public with the impression that, oh, wink, wink, nod, nod, I'm a member of the super duper commission and um, but I'm really here in my public and in my private capacity. You don't want to leave the impression that somehow um, it also, your private position also reflects your public uh, representation on the board or commission. And finally, the policy role of members. Um, members shall not interfere with the administrative functions of the city or the professional duties of the city staff. So your staff liaisons are working extra to provide services to help you, to help our boards and commissions accomplish that strategic work plan that nestles with our overall city plan. Um, and they have other jobs, they have other things that they do too. And so um, it's always something to keep in mind as you're working through your, your boards and committees and commissions that your staff liaison has another job too. So um, there you go. I think that takes care of that slide. Sorry, a lot of talking on that one. We're gonna move on to the next one. So there are kind of a, a collection of conduct, I'm gonna call them conduct guidelines on how elected and appointed officials interact with different layers of the public, with each other, with the staff. And so conduct with each other, we talked a little bit about how our, our chair and our committee members should act as we're interchanging in a board or commission, how we're discussing or debating things, polite, courteous, letting it being recognized, uh, recognizing the chair, things like that. You need to honor the role of the chair in maintaining order. So it's a clear meeting. Um, practice civility and decorum in discussions and debate, trying to avoid those personal attacks or personal comments that could affect uh, offend other members. Um, 
And we talked already about how you should be when you're appearing in front of another governmental agency or organization. And, you know, demonstrate effective problem solving. You know, two people maybe have a conflict or an issue and maybe the problem solves, hey, you know, let's get these, these folks together to try to resolve an issue. That's a, a problem solving thing. That's a, that's uh, an, an approach. This may not be the only approach, but that's an approach, right? Um, next slide, please. So then you have how do our boards and commissions interact with the public? So be welcoming to speakers and treat them with care and gentleness. Be gentle. Um, I actually saw a chair and, and nine times out of 10, that's the chair's job. The chair is the one who's recognizing the public member, calling for public comment. They're coming down. Many times the chair will take the opportunity to explain a decision, why you are doing something or acting in a certain way or the things you can consider in making a decision. So as you prepare yourself for your meetings and your hearings and your agendas, you can be thinking about some of that. Um, be fair and equitable in how you allocate your public hearing time to individual speakers. And again, you know, normally that's three minutes, right? Nine, nine times out of 10, it doesn't have to be three minutes, but, but usually it's at three minutes for general public comment. And if you're an applicant, sometimes you get extra time for one of those adjudicatory hearings. You might give them five minutes, you might give them 10 minutes. After all, it's their rights that are being judged by your committee or commission. Practice active listening, maintain an open mind, ask for clarification, but we don't inter um, we don't engage in debate and argument with the public members, even if they've said the most outrageous, disagreeable things you could ever imagine. And there are some members of the public, I know we all have heard of that, heard them. They come up to the, di the podium and they say, something that is a, a just out there in left field. <laughs> Shouldn't laugh, don't laugh at them, right? They are serious in their comments. They've taken their time to come down here and participate. And you know what? Respect for the process. I think we have a question. What is our policy on if somebody says something from the podium that's offensive, racist, anti-Semitic, something like that? I, I've listened to live um, planning commission and city council meetings from like Los Angeles where they they let free speech run amok. And some of the most horrific things are being said in the podium and the people aren't censored at all. And I'm not suggesting we censor, but at what point do we enforce decorum if they're saying something that's out of line, even while we are maintaining you know, their ability to have comment? Thank you for that question. That's a really great question. And I think it emphasizes one of the concepts that we talked about earlier, which is process. This is about process. People get to say, pretty much whatever they want to say. It's their First Amendment right. Even if it is so disagreeable, racist, outrageous, they get to say it. The, the line that you draw is where the comments are inciting riot. If, if there is, is disruption being caused, so sometimes you'll hear a chair say, don't talk to the audience, you talk to us. You talk to the dais. It's a way of maintaining the control and the, the respect for the process, because that is not an individual public member's pulpit to rally the rest of the audience. It's their opportunity to address the board or commission up here. So I don't know if that exactly answered your question, because it's a little bit of a fine fine line, um, there's been some changes at state law where they don't want you to even throw somebody out of order. It used to be you would warn them and that was enough. The chair had that authority 
to be able to do it. Now you have to actually warn them. You have to give them more notice, basically, that we're going to call you out of order and remove you from this meeting when they're being really disruptive because free speech trumps pretty much everything else. Thank you. Does inciting a riot include personal threat? Are they kind of interchangeable? Could be. It, it really depends. Normally, words are not enough for the personal threat. If, if they're words, if, you know what, Dennis, I'm going to hurt you. Are you scared? You should be. I'm going to get you. Okay. Is he scared? Should, should you remove me for saying that? No, probably not. But if I said, get my pen out, Dennis, I'm going to hurt you. And I make an action or I take it something or you're concerned because of something like that. So there's something additional than the words, then maybe that's enough. That's probably enough to say, Hey, settle down, address, the, you know, I would myself, I would try to call them back to order and calm it down. If I could, if they're really out of control, you can adjourn the meeting, adjourn the meeting, take a break, let them calm down, get control over the situation. Um, if necessary, you could always call our uh, police, our wonderful police department. They can come up and assist. If you really are concerned of physical violence or physical threat, you don't want to put yourselves in jeopardy or anybody else inside City Hall. We've all seen those things that have gone awry as well. So I'm not suggesting don't do it ever. Sometimes it's just common sense. Usually it's words plus an action is my back of the napkin rule. Thank you. Uh, just a couple things. So is the three minute cutoff, like they can spew whatever they're talking about and that, but at the three minutes, then they're done. And then who with this adjournment to like take a break, does the chairperson call that or does somebody have to make a motion it has to be second and then you can adjourn. Like you say, we're going to take a break, May I make a motion that we take a break for 15 minutes. I, I don't know how that process works. Thank you. I'll take the three minute question first. That's the easy one. Um, so Public comment really is guided by the chair. The chair has the flexibility under what we're going to talk about in a little bit under Robert's Rules of Order to adjust how much time you allow for. So on most of our agendas, we have a general rule that you're allowed to talk three minutes. I mean, if you read it right from the thing, but if you only have two or three people, the chair could say, you know what, today I'm going to let you talk for five. That would be perfectly okay. Or if you had a hundred people in the room, you are also within your power as the chair to say, you know what, I got a hundred people in the room. That's going to be like 25 hours. No, we're going to let you talk for two minutes or one minute. You know, that is, that is within the discretion of the chair. So three minutes is not, it's, it is an absolute. So if you set the time at three minutes, they get to spew their first amendment rights for three minutes. But then you can say that. Well, before. you do it and you do it artfully usually. Thank you so much. Your time is up. I've seen that. I've seen chair chairs let them go on, finish their sentence, a couple of, you know, it doesn't have to be an exact, but you try, you strive for that three minute, you strive for that. The, our mayor has let people talk more than three minutes. You know, I've seen other um, chair people cut them off right in the middle. Um, it's easier when you're on Zoom to cut somebody off at three minutes, but uh, you know, uh, it's it's a little bit of an art form. So that's the answer to your first question. Your second question, though, can you remind me what that was? Oh, how do you adjourn for a 15 minute break? Does the chairman do it, or do you need a motion yeah. a second? And a so, yeah. So um, if we're talking about the incite riot riot break, which I was referring to on a previous question. The chair, I believe, can just call that break. I, I think as part of um, the chair's uh, responsibility to control the meeting, 
he can suggest a he or she can uh, suggest a break. Um, and if somebody on the commission, I mean, there's another tool that can be used, not in the in instance of the incite riot. I'm, it's kind of a bad example because let's hope we don't ever have a commission meeting or a committee meeting where that happens. Uh, let's let's all hope that we can really culture and foster that inclus inclusivity that people feel comfortable and able to share, even if you don't agree with them, that they are able to be heard, right? So that goes a long way to help diffuse some of those really tense situations, even when you're gonna give somebody a really bad message or you're gonna disagree with their position or you're gonna take part of their view away or you're gonna, you know, whatever it is, you're gonna, you're gonna impose a charge on their property to clean the stuff involuntarily out of their yard. You're gonna declare it a public nuisance. You know, I mean, you have some flexibility, but there's a point of order. If I got a bathroom big point of order, excuse me, okay, chair, I gotta go. You know, I mean, there are other ways to get a break. And then the chair can say, oh, point of order, yes, thank you. We'll take a five minute break or whatever it is. So does that answer your question? Yes, I didn't know about point of order, um, but um, my toolbox now. <laughs> um, you said about being heard, and uh, I'm going to go back a little bit in the history. You had a council person that um, hosted something in public, and then he was uh, sanctioned almost at the city council. And if the very seaside is saying it's your First Amendment right to say things, but not to be crucified or brought up on charges or sanctioned or whatever, uh, what happened to that council person with a lot of people in an uproar about it uh, doesn't go with the flow of what you just said, or am I mistaken? Yeah, I think in that case, you would be mistaken. So as much First Amendment right as individuals have to address the board or commission, the commissions also have First Amendment rights to say what they think. And in that particular instance, the only way a board can say or the city council can say their feelings, their thoughts, their corrections about what they thought was the actual message or whatever was to do it in that kind of form because we're going to talk about brown act and brown act violations in a minute and if you had had two or three if you had had three people on the city council talking about that particular instance posting on facebook you would have had a brown act violation and that would be, would have been equally if not worse than getting it out in the open and talking about it I'm not saying it's right, it's wrong. I'm just saying it's a First Amendment right that your board or commission has to engage um, with one of your fellow council people. I hope it's not a dumb question, but profanity is not tolerated in the, in the chamber here, right? I'd like to say a bad word and then say no, but yes, we, we strive for civility and decorum, you know, you could probably say, gosh, gosh darn, maybe, yeah. but shucks. But yes, you would not want to use profanity. That's a good rule. Very good rule. When I was in San Mateo, they brought up that where there's a whole different cultures that come into these meetings and people speak differently than others. Uh, using different words, things like that. And uh, does that take into account when you guys are looking at that, if you break the rules or whatever, is where they're from? Because, I mean, uh, Texas uses whole different words than we do in Northern California. That's where I'm from. So, I mean, you just got to learn. But yeah, uh, very good uh, question. And lawyers use different words than everybody else, too. I mean, you know, I might use, you know, carpe diem and not everybody would know what that means, right? I mean, there are, there are words. And when people are down at the podium speaking, you, you're not going to correct them. 
from my, my lens, I try to just understand. It's not exactly how you say it. It's what are you trying to say to, what is your message to me, <clears throat> they, us on the dais? That's why you're here. You're trying to convey a, a thought. So from my hat, I don't, I just try to understand what the message is, no matter what the words that are used. And Sherry, will you also touch on um, in regards to the um, appointed officials and their conduct with the public in regards to public comment and the dialogue that should or should not happen? Right. So um, as you are calling people for public comment, um, nobody on the commission should be engaging with the public. You are here to listen to the public comment. You're not here to cross-examine them or to do anything like that or to argue with them. Yes, we should have Planned Parenthood. No, we shouldn't have Planned Parenthood. Yes, we should have vaccinations. No, we should not have vaccinated. That's not your job. That's not our job on the, the dais. Our job is just to listen to what the public has to say. Is that um, I think I said that before, but but in case I was less than clear, hopefully that's clear enough. So thank you. I just have one question from Zoom. Um, what about a commissioner slipping and swearing? You know, all I'm gonna say is sometimes, sometimes stuff happens. Sometimes stuff happens. You can, you can create a four letter word substitute for su stuff if you would like, but if it's a one-off, I slipped, I fell, I go crap, you know, that's, it's, it's okay. Where, where you don't, what you don't want to do is you don't want to continually use a four letter word to refer to every single thing that's on the agenda. Crap, I'm on B. Crap, I'm on C. You know, I mean, that is the profanity that we're talking about when we say don't. But if you happen to utter a bad profane, profane word, it's not, we're not going to call out the profanity police on you because you tripped and fell. And I don't think, to be fair, I don't think the members of the public, they might be a little offended, but they're going to be understanding. They just saw you trip down the stairs, shouting profanities, going, dang it, get these steps fixed. You know, they are going to understand that and realize that you're not directing that profanity at them. It's not a perpetual thing. It's a one-off and that would be okay. Question. One more question. Oh, do you have Okay. Um, is there specific social media um, uh, rules or regulations that we need to abide by? That's a great question. So there are some laws that govern when it's a Brown Act violation when you're on social media. And um, the city does have a social media policy, but it doesn't really get all the way down to the granular level of what you can say, what you can't say. Can I give an emoji, a like, or a dislike, or a other emoji that could be profane? No, those are, you know, you should refrain from doing that, period. People are going to post things on social media all the time. You should refrain from responding because we're going to talk about Brown Act violations in a minute or two. And that is a way to send a message to your co-people what you what you think and what you're going to do on any certain item that might be out there. If it's your your um, friend, you're going to go to a birthday party. You know that's that's something different. But if it's something like that, you know, is controversial, it's going to come before your board or commission. You might have to weigh in on a new park, for example, or a park name. I'm just making something up here, but. That, that is where you get in trouble because you're not seen as independent. You're seen as trying to generate uh, a, uh, a quorum or consensus before you get to the public and you actually have the public discourse and interchange that we're looking for from the boards and commissions. Does that make sense? 
Okay. Next slide. So elected and appointed uh, officials conduct with staff. I just have one question before you go forward. Oh. Just one quick clarification. I am the vice chairman of the safety commission, and I wanted to get just further clarification in terms of what the vice chairman can stop and start in terms of the profanity. If there are members of the commission or members of the public with excessive profanity, is it within the responsibilities of the chairman and the vice chairman to say that type of language is personally offensive to me and to members of my commission, and can we stop it? Can I say something? Is so, it within my rights yeah, or thank responsibilities? You. Yeah, thank you so much for, for that on the vice chair's um, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So normally the flow of the meeting is in the chair's responsibility. So your chairperson should be saying something. If there's a lot of profanity being spewed about, hey, this you know we'd like to maintain civility and decorum. Please refrain from using profane words, you know as a individual or as a vice chair, it doesn't even have to be a vice chair. It can be any member of the commission can do a point of order and raise that issue to the entire commission, but you would not raise it to the public. The way you would raise it is you would say point chair, point of order. I am bothered by all of the profanity that is happening in this room right now. And then it's the chairperson's responsibility to take that information and run with it to how to address it. And same thing, point of order is also used. I'm too hot, I'm too cold. You know, it's like things, excuse me. I was gonna say, it's, it's almost like saying, excuse me. Yeah. When you say order. point of order. Yeah. yeah, it's, but it's, but it's for <laughs> things. It's, excuse me, I gotta go. Excuse me, I'm too hot. Excuse me, there's too much profanity going on here. Yeah, that's a, a good way to think about it. The excuse me point of order. So we were gonna move on to interactions with city staff. We talked a little bit about, you know, that our, our staff liaisons have other jobs too. They are there to help your board or commission. On the one hand, on the other hand, um, need to treat them as professionals. They are professionals. They are professional folks. Um, they have other jobs that they have to do. So sometimes I know the chair, the vice chair, or even a member might say, hey, you know, I really have to talk to you because of whatever the issue is. And it's just knowing that they have that other job, they might not be able to get back to you immediately. Sending an email sometimes is helpful. Sometimes picking up the phone is helpful. You'll get a feel for it as you move through your um services, your service appointments. Um, any formal question should be directed to the staff through the city manager. So if you really want staff person to do something, you need to ask city manager. City manager controls the staff with the exception of, as a control me or my staff, but everybody else, city manager's got it. Um, never publicly criticize an individual employee. It's okay to be critical in general of the city or uh, a staff job, not an individual staff person. It would, here's an example. Dominique, you did a really bad job cleaning up the office. That's an individual attack. But I could say the generic way, you know, we really could as a city do a better job cleaning our offices. I'm not attacking Dominique but I'm putting out there the generic statement, you know, from a, I'm, I'm a representative of a public. It'd be really great if our city offices looked a little bit better. That's the way you might deliver a critical message, or you might pull your staff liaison aside and say, Hey, you know, it'd be really great if we could do something about some of our public offices. Yeah. There are a lot of ways to get your message across to the city staff. We are busy. We try very hard to, balance all the duties that we have. Do not get involved in administrative functions. I know Gina would be really upset if you got involved in her administrative functions. Do not solicit political support from staff. We can't do it. And above all, for the attorney, I'm sorry, I'm not your personal attorney. I represent the city. <laughs> And as, as much as you might like me to be your personal attorney from time to time, 
I'm, I just can't do it. And I will say that I cannot give you legal advice, but you might consider, I can give you referrals. If you need a private lawyer, I can give you referrals to three or four different attorneys that you might contact for that. But I actually represent the city. I don't even represent individual city council members or anything else like that. That's just not what I do. My job is to protect the city and to think about it from that standpoint. Over to you, I think, Dominique, are you on ethics training? All right, so we're gonna go right into our ethics and our conflict of interest code. Um, so first we have um, Assembly Bill 1234, and this was actually would be called out in your uh, welcome letter. Um, if you um, have been appointed to a commission um, since I've been here as city clerk in the last two years, in your welcome letter, you would have received um, some information in regards to the public service ethics training that is required to take, that you're required to take every two years. And um, this is for all um, governing bodies of a local agency in which this particular requirement must be met. It, so it is for the city council, any boards, commissions, committees, and any other local agency bodies, whether you are permanent or temporary, decision-making, legislative, advisory, all must participate and take this training. Um, and typically you can do that online. Um, it's offered through the um, FPPC, the uh, Fair Political Practices Commission. Um, there is an online ethics course that um, I often share with commissioners um, that's on the FPPC's website in which you can take that training, print your certificate, send me a copy so that it's uh, in your file. Um, and then also we have our um, conflict of interest code. Um, mostly that is administered through um, the form 700, um, which you're required to um, fill out uh, every year annually. And then we have a question here. Um, hi, I remember take, uh, filling out this, um, but do we get a reminder from you or are we supposed to remember this on our own to fill out this ethics um, form on our own? So typically the um, when you sign in for the FPPC's um, online ethics course, if you take it through that method, um, I believe that they send out a uh, reminder. I have not sent out reminders, um, but we are working on getting a, a board and commission management tool that will help us um, to put those reminders out. But that's another purpose of the annual training is that um, if you know that it's been more than two years um, or if you're not sure, then you have a, you know, another reminder to make sure that you get your ethics training in. And, and actually, Dominique, they can also just check with you. If, if they're not sure, they can call you up because you have yes, their absolutely. last certificate on file. Right? Yes, yes. And so we do have a database where we have access to check on the, the last time that you've taken a um, ethics training course. You don't want to <laughs> I'll, I'll just go ahead and write that note to go ahead and just send that out for you guys. There's another question down here. Uh, I saw it. What about the financial disclosures? It says financial disclosure forms are filed with the city clerk as a matter of public record. We have to file those. Yes, every year. You usually, when you're when you when you were first appointed, um, just because I know it was recently, um, you would have filled it out on your when you um, did your oath of office, um, and so we would have that on file. Okay, I guess I, guess I forgot. So it doesn't have to be done annually. It that does. one has to be done annually. Oh, it does. Yes. So do we have to just remember to send that back in or? Or do well, you send out a notice for that too? Usually for the Form 700s, I'll send out um, a notice for um, a reminder uh, because they're due on April 1st of the year. And actually there are two, two forms. So when you take office, you file one of those within 30 days, right. usually of taking office, you'll, you'll sign and fill out a Form 700 that says, you know, 
the kinds of property and financial interests you hold in the jurisdiction that you're serving. And it's not just boards and commissions, by the way, it's certain um, city staff yes. as well. So I have to do that. City manager has to do it. There's a whole list in our city code of the positions that have to do that because we make a lot of decisions every day that affect financial um, financial. Uh, Come on, help me out here. They they affect the finances of the city, and right. they you don't they want to make sure that I'm recusing myself if you know I say oh yeah I'd really like to do something right next to my house you know I mean that's the kind of thing that um, everybody wants to make sure is out there and open and public. Right. Um, and then if you leave office, so if you are resigning from a board or commission within 30 days, you have to also um, fill out and sign a form 700, uh, it's called leaving office. So there's a leaving office form that you fill out and you file um, with the FPPC, I think. And it might even be local with your city clerk, but Dominique can help you with, with that. But it's going into office and leaving office. And we have to remember that? No, she will help you remember. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just saying, well, think about it this way. Do you want the state to keep sending you notices if you're no longer serving on a board or commission? No. So that's why you're you're filing that, hey, state, I'm leaving office. So they have a bright line that says, oh yeah, she left office last year. I'm not gonna send her a reminder for this year. Does that make sense? Yeah. So. And then I also um, utilize the staff liaisons to, um, remind the commissions um, as well so that they have that information. And usually it's a little um, more direct, usually like in reports from staff on your agenda. Um, at some point, you should be hearing that announcement come from your staff liaison as well. Right. So were you going to talk about the recusal process or would you like me to address that one? So the form, we talked about the form, mm -hmm. filing the form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was under my political reform um, act. But if you want to go ahead and. No, so you filled out the form, you've declared, you filed the, the form. So now you're at your board or commission and you're getting ready to take action on something or make a recommendation that might affect your own personal financial interest. And this is really most appropriate at the planning commission level where you're making those adjudicatory decisions, but there could be something on like the art and history museum. You want to recommend that the wall next to your house is painted because it's going to look a lot better. And oh, by the way, the side benefit is my house value just went up a hundred thousand dollars because I got this beautiful piece of art right next to me. That is an example of where you have an interest, you have a financial interest in something that's coming before your board and you should disclose it. Talk to your staff liaison. If you have a question, you should recuse yourself on the record. If it's a direct financial impact on you personally. Um, and if you're unsure, you know, this is what my predecessor said to me. If you think you have a conflict of interest, you probably do. You probably do, right? And, and I can argue all, all I want. Sometimes people will come to me and they'll say, God, I don't know. You know, I think I have a, a, a conflict of interest. And so I'll have them describe the facts, what they do. And I said, well, here's the thing. You might not legally have a conflict of interest, but if you think you have a conflict of interest, it's probably going to appear like you have a conflict of interest. And that's another ground for you to step step aside from the decision-making process. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if you have any questions, you can call, you can talk to your staff liaison. They can call me. You can call me directly. You can talk to Dominique. We are here to help you um, make sure you are ethical and doing appropriate disclosures. And I'll just add to that, um, that you also want to make sure, pay special attention to those different financial interests that you might have that might cause you to have to recuse yourself. Um, so especially in reviewing your agenda and the agenda packet, and you kind of, you have that question, um, because your recusal can pose issues for the remainder of your commission if it affects your quorum um, and the number of voting members that you have left available. Um, to the to make that decision as well. So that's just something to consider 
um, as you uh, think about that particular piece of the Political Reform Act in Conflict of Interest Code. All right, so we're gonna go right into the Ralph M. Brown Act. And this is where, this is kind of the um, milk and cookies of your, of your meetings. Um, having this information and knowing this information is um, definitely going to um, help you have an understanding of why meetings are run the way that they're run and some of the rules that you hear about um, and the Ralph and the, the Brown Act is kind of the reasoning uh, behind a lot of the substance behind that as well. So uh, the Brown Act. So, so what is the Brown Act? How does it affect the agenda? The Brown Act is basically a law that guarantees um, the public's right to attend and participate um, in commission meetings. Um, commissions, committees, boards, city council. Um, and the purpose of it is so that the public can participate in the in the discussion, provide their viewpoint, provide their insight to the body um, in which they are um, addressing. And so the Brown Act covers um, one of the things in regards to the agenda, um, in regards to the the process for developing the agenda. Typically your chairperson um, will work with your staff liaison um, and the commission clerk to generate the agenda, get it published, um, because one of the uh, rules of the Brown Act is that there are certain guidelines for posting the agenda in a certain timeline um, so that your the public has adequate notice of what's happening um, at that meeting. Also, for the actual agenda, the titles that are given to your agenda items must um, accurately uh, give a brief um, insight to a member of the public um, so that they can decide as to whether they want to participate in that public forum or not um, regarding a certain topic. So your agenda items have to be descriptive enough in order to um, allow someone who may not know a whole lot, will may not know a whole lot about the topic, but at least give them the ability to make the decision as to whether they want to particip participate or not. Um, in regards to the meeting process, uh, the Brown Act also has a hand in this as well. Um, in regards to the meetings are called um, by your chairperson, or your vice chair if your uh, chairperson is uh, absent. And um, they are to facilitate the meeting in their role um, as we you know, described and went through earlier. Um, so in regards to that meeting process, when you have your meeting and you uh, go through the order on your agenda, there are some standard areas or standard sections of the meeting or agenda um, that you'll see that are pretty much universal, um, especially the way that we do it here um, for City of Seaside. You'll definitely have a call to order, um, which is by your, uh, your chair does your call to order. You'll have roll call so that you can establish to ensure that you have a quorum. You'll have public comment. Um, general public comment for items that are not on the agenda um, are usually there. Then you have your actual items that you're considering. Your chair will typically read the title of the agenda, the agenda item out um, for the record um, so that it's clear as to what topic of discussion um, is happening. Staff will usually give their presentation or there's a presentation provided. Um, if, any, if the dais or the commission has any questions, they will ask that of the staff. Then it's open for public comment. You receive your public comment, public comment is closed. It comes back to the board to um, have a discussion in regards to the presentation and the public comment that they've received. Um, and then there is a decision that is made. Um, there, you know, the action that you're looking to take um, will commence at that point. Did you have anything to add to that? No, that was pretty uh, thorough. And it actually crosses over multiple things. So, yes. so uh, Dominique kind of gave you the whole whole thing that crosses over to the 
Robert's Rules of Order and the Brown Act, yeah. but uh, generally that's exactly right. Uh, Brown Act sometimes is called the Sunshine Law. I don't know mm -hmm. if any of you have heard that. Sunshine Law, that's um, because it's sunshine on governmental actions. Mm -hmm. That is the idea. We, are, we serve the public, you serve the public, we all serve the public in the way we are doing our business. So that is, if you think about it that way all the time, you're gonna be hopefully pretty compliant with the Brown Act. Okay. We have a question, Mr. Bobby. Okay, in the recent past, we have uh, begun having hybrid meetings. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the event that the televised or, or uh, video, audio part of it is not working, does that meeting actually exist? Because the public doesn't have really a, a, a time to have any input. Yeah, I'll take that one. So on our, so the city of Seaside actually has in-person meetings now. We offer hybrid meetings for the convenience of public participation. And if your technology goes down, that is on the public participation because they have the opportunity to come here. So it doesn't mean your commission meeting has to be stopped. It's not like when we were doing the full hybrid meetings when the commissioners or the city council members were on Zoom. That's a different, that's a different type of meeting, a different type of hybrid Zoom meeting. And we don't do those meetings anymore. We are in person with quorum in person now, and the public is allowed to participate still by Zoom or by phone. As it is available. As it is available, correct. So I have another question. Um, I've noticed that, that some of the agenda item descriptions or the titles, they're extremely long. Do I need to read the whole thing? I started to sort of redact some of the end part because the staff report will kind of cover that, but I don't want to be in violation of, you know, of the Brown Act or the Robert Rules of Order or any of that. So what, what is your advice on it? Or can the description be shorter with more of the detailed stuff like the APN number and all that stuff as, as a subtext? I can take that one too. Sorry, Dominique. Um, so technically your agenda is your technical notice to the public. So having more words for the public, making sure that they know what piece of property it is. We actually are under a duty to make sure that that agenda and those agenda titles are on front page of our webpage. They're easily accessible. So, but as the chair calling the meeting, you can say, you, you have a lot of discretion. You can say, okay, I'm moving on to agenda 10A. We're gonna talk about the property located at 1272 Canyon Del Rey. About, you know, I mean, you could give a high level description because your fault, your, the agenda has already set forth everything that's out there. Um, it is a good idea if you have people on Zoom. And I noticed that, we don't normally have too many participants on Zoom. Sometimes reading the whole agenda title is beneficial to them because they don't necessarily they aren't necessarily looking at that hard copy agenda. So it's really kind of a courtesy, but I think a summary of it, you know, skipping some of the words. I do that when I read us back in from closed session. You know, I don't read all of the, sometimes I don't read all the words. Sometimes I'll say, oh, we're going to do this. And we, they did this and they did that. And there's nothing to report or, you know, whatever it is. And I think also with planning commission, they probably have the longest agenda titles. <laughs> They're like right at the maximum words you can put on there. So we don't fault you for not wanting to read the entire thing. But thank you for your commitment. <laughs> we appreciate it. All right. So we're going to go and get a little bit more specific in regards to the Brown Act and how it applies to meetings. So first, understanding, you know, what constitutes a meeting. Um, 
It's simply just a congregation of the majority at the same time and place. So that does not have to be at this dais. That could be outside city hall in the parking lot after your meeting. It could be at a you know, city function. That is a congregation of the majority. Where it gets starts to get a little tricky is what you all talk about when you're in that congregation of the majority in other places outside of the location, time, and place that is on an agenda. Um, so to for a for a majority of a commission, um, when they have a meeting, um, that location, time, and place is listed on the agenda, the titles of the items, and they're there at that meeting. Their purpose is to hear, discuss, deliberate, and take action on the items on that agenda. If that happens outside of the time, place, and location that is posted on the agenda in the timeline that is prescribed for the type of meeting that you're having, then you would be in violation of the Brown Act um, in that um, instance. So there are uh, three different types of meeting that are most typically used um, here in Seaside with our commissions. And that is a regular meeting, a special meeting, um, and an adjourned meeting. Adjourned meetings aren't used very often. Um, the city council has used them every now and then. Um, we usually just, you know, ride on till midnight. So we don't usually have adjourned meetings, but a regular meeting requires that the agenda be posted at least 72 hours in advance. Um, so if you have your commission meeting on, you know, Wednesday or Thursday, you'll usually see it go out on the Friday so that it doesn't have to be posted on a weekend day. Um, special meetings require 24 hours notice. Um, and then the adjourned meetings requires the agenda posting as, as a special meeting with the start time and place um, of where it's going to occur. Right. And just to add to that adjourned meeting, adjourned meeting is um, here's an example. It would be you're in a planning commission meeting. It's 1030 at night. You're hearing a build uh, a design approval for a two story building. You got 100 people in the audience. You go, you know what? We're not going to finish tonight. I'd like to adjourn this meeting to Tuesday at five o'clock. So usually you're giving notice of the adjourned meeting ahead of time. And then Dominique is following up with the posting of the 24 hour notice, the actual written notice, but it's usually you adjourn to a time and a place, a certain, a time certain to complete the item that you started. So, um, so let's say you're on one of the commissions and you attend the city council meeting and you take notes about something that was discussed. Is it a violation of the Brown Act to share your notes with the rest of the commission? As long as you're not discussing, you're just sharing the notes. So it depends on whether that, if an item has come to the city council, um, it would typically, Generally speaking, it would be okay to send your notes off to um, the other commissioners. You would definitely want to do that through your staff liaison because if you send an email and everybody's in the two line and someone hits reply all um, and that item ends up being on an agenda, that's a Brown Act violation. So if you have anything to transmit to the rest of your commission, you want to you know do that through your liaison. Um, but if something is, if an item has already come to the city council, it's very unlikely that it would end up on a commission agenda after the fact, uh, depending on what it is. I mean, there's always the possibility, but. Yeah, I, I think um, I was actually going to make this comment a little bit earlier on um, determining about the things when Dominique was uh, explaining how easy it is to get into a Brown Act violation. You really have to know the charge of your commission. And so, for example, let's say you were on the Parks and Rec Commission. I'm just going to pick on Parks and Rec because there's so much fun to pick on. Mm -hmm. um, and I use the example of naming a brand new park that's going to come before the, the Parks and Rec Commission. And you're out here at the farmer's market and there's five of you, you gather around and you start talking about, God, you know, wouldn't it be great to have a park over 
over here up on Fort Ord, right by the Veterans Cemetery. You know, would, wouldn't it be great if we called it Veterans Park? We don't have any such park. We don't even have a park master plan like that. We don't, you know, we don't have any of that. It's like something that's way out there in the ether. It's the twilight zone. But guess what? Your charge is to look at potential locations for new parks. Your charge is to think about maybe naming the parks. That is a Brown Act violation right there. Boom. It seems innocent. You're just kicking it around, just kicking the dirt around. Boom. Art and History Commission, same thing. You might be out there um, looking at having a Canadian goose statue somewhere. <laughs> because a statue of a Canadian goose would be a lot better than having all those little birdies try to stop traffic, right? Mm -hmm. And you get together and you go, God, wouldn't it be great to just have a Canadian goose statue right here? And there's enough of you together kicking it around. Brown Act violation, because that could come before your commission right? Because you're recommending on public art and that's going to be seen as a public art, art thing. So you got to really be conscious of the charge of your commission. Sorry. So in a nutshell, you shouldn't really discuss anything that's coming up on the future agenda with any of your commissioners. Correct. Or any councilman or council person or anything like that until you get into the room of your commission uh, well with your commissioners for certain because sure. it's so your no discussion i mean i go over to bob's house we're having a couple beers and he goes what do you think of this so if you're talking to one of your commissioners you can do that you have to be careful of a couple of different kinds of meetings so one thing that we didn't talk about but maybe it's on a different slide i'm not sure is the serial meeting or the the wheel and hub a lot of times it's called wheel and hub where you have coffee with Will and you talk about it. It's only two of you. You're not a quorum. And then you have a coffee with Bobby and you talk about it. Still not a quorum, but guess what? Three of you are a quorum on a five member board or commission. So that's like a wheel and a hub. You're, you're the hub of the wheel and you're telling the information and you're sharing the information with a majority of your committee members. The other one is a serial meeting where you have coffee with Will. Will has coffee with Shonda and, and gives her what they just said on the last meeting. That's a serial meeting. That's also a Brown Act violation. So you just have to be conscious of the kind of com uh, conversations you're having with each other and collectively. And, and then with respect to sharing your information or your conversations with a council person, that can also be a Brown Act violation, but in a different way, um, depending on how you do it with your council people, if, because it could still be a spoken hub, right? So the recommendation for the name of a park, for example, Parks Commission recommends certain name Veterans Park. And you call up uh, Mayor Pro Tem and call up the mayor and you say, hey, you know, wouldn't it be great to have Veterans Park? You know, wouldn't it be great? To, you know, and you start generating something that, that's going to come to the city council. Then you're going to have Brown Act violation could, could have one up here on the dais as well. So not saying don't talk to your your council people representatives. You can do that. You just got to be careful that you aren't talking to a majority of them and trying to share the consensus. So a lot of times it's why staff briefs our city council because I can talk to all five of them. They can't talk to each other, but I don't, I'm really careful with what I say to them. Hi, Mayor Pro Tem, how are you doing today? Hey, do you have any questions, comments, or concerns on the agenda? And you can ask any one of them and every one of them will say, that's exactly what I say to them. And I say that for a reason. Because I never say to them, oh, hey, Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, yes, the mayor said item 10B was a go. I never say that. I always am very high level. I always follow a script on how I'm prepping the city council. And I would encourage you to have a script or think about it like that. Very careful about how we do that. I don't have a mic, but what happens if the Brown Act is broken? 
on your commission. Oh, yes, I, I mean, I mean, if four people walk in and they say, let's vote on this, and they all vote, and we didn't even discuss anything, uh, you knew it was something that happened outside the... I think that's a really wonderful question, but I'm going to let Dominique actually talk about the next slide, and then we're going to answer your question, okay? The next one is on violations, but I have one from Zoom. Um, what's the guidance if a city staff person is approached by a commissioner um, and they begin speaking on a topic related to their commission or committee? I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase it. So it, I'm going to rephrase it on their behalf. So if I'm a city staff person and I'm approached by a commissioner member that I'm not the liaison to, and they begin speaking on a topic related to their commission or committee. That's not a Brown Act violation. You're, you're allowed to talk to other staff people and other staff people are allowed to talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, however, if you... We talked about interfering with official duties. That's where it could get a little bit um, problematic. You don't want to interfere inappropriately with another staff person by talking to them about an issue that really should be discussed with your own staff liaison, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Okay. And I think before we get over to the next um, slide, just the, the major... Um, part that I just want to, want to stick with you all is that the violation of the Brown Act, um, it becomes a violation because the public did not have the opportunity to engage in the discussion with you. You've had it already. You've already discussed it among the members. So there is no public input available to them if you're on an email chain. There is no public input available if you randomly run into a quorum of the members. They had no opportunity to provide you with information, with their insight, with their opinion. And because you've denied them their right, you are in violation of this Brown, this law that is meant to protect that because the priority of the Brown Act is to protect the public's right to interact with the commissions, committees, their city council about the decisions that they're making about the community that they live in, that they reside in and the decisions that affect them personally. So if they don't have an opportunity to engage with you, then you've denied them their opportunity and their right to um, participate in civic engagement. Go ahead. So I think I heard you say, if it's less than a quorum, you could talk about stuff, but you're really, I mean, why? It, you could just so easily get into the chain, you could get into the hub and spoke. Yeah. How about after we were done, we adjourn, we're excited, we did something fabulous, we're on our way to our cars and we're talking about what we did because we're excited. Is Is that a possible Brown Act violation? It's after, we're just, so we can't. I'll, I'll let Sherry get that. Yeah, it, it could be. It could be because your it depends on what the decision was and where it's going. You, if you're an advisory body, you collectively made a recommendation or you're going to make a recommendation to the city council. So guess what? The city council could say, you know what? We don't really like that recommendation. Let's send it back to the commission to think about A, B, or C. Well, guess what? Now you've been so excited and happy and you talked about it and it could come back before you again so you just never know when it's going to come back before you before you as a commission again and i'm just going to do the next slide and i think we've kind of already talked about it but, but we've been talking a lot about the discussions prong of this these are some common brown act violations i think we also already talked a little bit about social media and we talked a little bit about emails and so I'm going to answer um, Mr. Reardon's question with respect to the remedy. So let's just say you've got a violation here and a member of the public has said either to you or they say to the city council, you know what, I didn't, there was a Brown Act violation and I didn't get a chance to participate in the recommendation that is being presented to you city council. 
Um, the city council has lots of remedies. The most extreme remedy that the city council can do, and they might turn to me, is they can throw out your recommendations. So all the good hard work that you're doing, if you're an advisory board, could be out the window. That's, that's one thing. They might also remand it back to you to have an, a more engaged public discussion. I mean, there are lots of things that they can do to fix a Brown Act violation. We're trying to make sure that you know what the Brown Act violations could be to help avoid that kind of a situation. And in the Planning Commission or in the Neighborhood Improvement Commission arena, when you are on an adjudicatory hearing, it can be an even bigger deal because you, um, those are people's rights. They, they, they could sue the city on that. And even though there are appeal rights to the city council and the city council can cure some of it, some of those um, potential violations, always better not to have them in the first place. Um, I, I'm just gonna keep it short like that. Hopefully that answers your question in terms of what the remedy, that's the most extreme remedy. Set it aside, you could get sued if it's an adjudication thing. And if it's really, really bad and you keep doing it, the city council might decide to change the board or commission. You know, if, if you're just not getting it, and I'm not saying they will do that. I'm just saying that is a potential thing because it's part of your duty and your successful service to the city to try to educate yourself on the mission of your board, try to follow the Brown Act to the best of your ability, try to, you know, try to comply, try to follow the ethics and the financial disclosures, et cetera. So, and I know you guys are all listening very carefully, so you will all get it and there won't be any problems. <laughs> yes, and I'll also share with you all the resource of the full um, Brown Act um, so that you can do a deeper dive in um, some of the scenarios that they give as well, if you care to. <laughs> but um, we'll go ahead and if there are any questions on um, Brown Act, we'll go ahead and move on to our uh, next piece, which is about the Public Records Act. Um, and this is just the uh, written piece of um, the Brown Act um, in regards to that the public's business is always supposed to be public. So that includes um, items that are written. So um, like mentioned earlier, the Form 700s, agendas, reports, um, emails, um, all of those different uh, documents that are given to you, especially you'll mostly notice um, when we have public comment and someone has something to hand to the commission, um, that becomes a part of the public record. They now released it over to the body. And um, if you receive it at the time of the meeting, then we just save it and we will make it available to um, through any requests that we have. Um, but that's also another reason why we really um, hone in a lot on the Brown Act because it can move over to the written side um, where that information becomes a public record. So if there is a request for um, emails or um, information that's pertaining to your particular role um, on a commission and the communication that you've had with staff, with each other, um, to prove or disprove um, Brown Act violations, um, then we would all be subject to that uh, as well. Did you have anything to add? Um, Act? No, I, I think that pretty much says it, you know, any kind of writing, public records are any kind of writing generally. So texts, emails, form 700s are public records, you know, anything like, like that. Those, those become public records. And Dominique and my assistant work a lot of time responding to Public Records Act requests. And they are all over the board. You would be probably amazed at what people ask for. Um, when, when somebody comes as a public speaker to the podium, 
and they hand an exhibit to us that they want us to see, does that become part of the public record? Because then we had an instance last night at the Planning Commission where they passed around some photographs and then one person passed their phone to look at. That wasn't something we could submit. So should I handle that differently if they're not going to leave it as the possession of the, um, the Planning Commission in that instance? Uh, yes. Yeah, so typically, well, what I did for last night was I had her email me the photos that she showed to the um, planning commission and the pictures um, or any materials that I receive, I keep and they're part of the administrative file for that particular board commission um, that's kept permanently on record with the city. Yeah. So, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, if if somebody hands you the phone, I mean, your your clerk handled the situation. But if somebody hands it to 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 the commission, you start passing the phone down the row. You, you need to say to probably something for the benefit of the public and people on Zoom. Um, we are looking at pictures, and uh, we've respectfully requested that they be emailed to the clerk so they can be submitted into the public record. So, and if you think about it. If somebody sued or challenged the, your decision and you had looked at pictures, but they didn't go into the public record, I know Certainly. as a lawyer, I would be uh, ready to sue your sorry bones. Yeah, it was it was very atypical, but it was so, or I could say in that situation, right. I'm sorry, you needed to send this in in advance or you missed that, or to handle it some different way. It, it, it kind of sprung on us and it was very yeah, unusual. Was. And all of a sudden she was up here and wanted to, to show the phone to everybody and walk behind the, the dais. And I stopped that, but I was like, pass it through and, you know, but it was, okay, so you did get the email and then we were covered, but all right, I will avoid that in the future thing. And that's another um, thing in regards to, for your, for, for ch our chair people, um, when something is happening um, at a meeting that's you know off script, um, it is always nice to say that out loud, not just for for the benefit of the public, but for accessibility as well. Because if you have a blind person sitting in the uh, audience, they don't know what's going on. So for you to verbalize that and say that for the record, um, then that allows them to have, you know, that's like the alternative text on the web. You have that alternative, you know, verbal communication as well as your meeting is going on. Um, and I think that's another way of just um, keeping the order of a meeting as well by, you know, allowing that communication to happen between the commission and the members of the public um, as well. So we were going to do an interactive opportunity for role play, but we will not. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we're going to press fast forward. We're going to press fast forward. So Robert's Rules of Order, you know, here we go. 12th edition, our municipal code says this is what you're supposed to use. All this is, this is a humongous book, way too complicated for all of us. Even though this is what our code says we're supposed to use, it's really just a parliamentary procedure developed to keep meetings fair and orderly, efficient, and democratic. My suggestion to all of us is to keep it simple. Don't get hung up on the Roberts Rules of Order. It's got to be this or it's got to be that. It's as our clerk was outlining how the process was going before you go, okay, we're going to call item 10A. It's the review of a design review at 1216 Canyon Del Rey. Staff, could you please approach and give your presentation? Staff gives the presentation. I mean, it's, it's orderly, right? You bringing it back to the, to the, to the dais. Does anybody have any questions of the staff? Perfect example, keeping it going, keeping it efficient. You get to the end, you, you um, ask the questions, you might give the applicant the option to give their presentation, bring it back. Do you have any questions for the applicant? Okay, now we're gonna open up to the public. Public, please, please approach, give your everything that's wrong with the project, bring it back to the dais. All right, what is the will of the dais? That's where you end up with. And, I move to approve. I have questions. I have comments. You go, you let everybody have their say, and then you keep it simple. I move, we approve. 
blah, blah, blah. I move, we deny. I don't really want to move uh, full approval. I move that we approve it with the following conditions. Is there a second? Simple, simple, keep it simple. And then you can, you know, anybody have a question on the, on the motion? That's your motion. You have questions, you can discuss it, you can comment. Somebody might say, call for the question and you take a vote. And at this time, because we are in person, we can have voice votes. We don't, with limited exceptions, because you're all advisory boards with the exception of the Planning Commission and the NIC, um, we don't have really a need for roll call votes uh, to do it. I mean, you can if you want to, but you don't need to do it that way. Um, there are lots of things you can get really confusing on it. You can have friendly amendments to the motion. You can have substitute motions. There are lots and lots. I was going to give you the simplified cheat sheet for Robert Searle's order. And I, I took a look at it. And even the simplified cheat sheet was, um, there was a lot of stuff in there that, I, I don't mean it to be inappropriate, but we're, we're boards and commissions. We don't have to be too fancy dancy. We just need to be clear. We need to be orderly and fair about how we're moving our business through the public. And if you have any questions or you get stuck on a procedure or a parliamentary thing, your staff liaison is your um, advisory parliamentarian. And I can tell you right now that I've, I've received the seven o'clock call from the staff liaison saying, hey, we got this issue on whatever point of order and what, what am I supposed to do? You know I mean? So they will call the city attorney if they need to, or they could call the city clerk. But my advice to you is just keep it simple. Here's a motion. Here's a second. Here's what we're going to do. And if that's any, I, there you go. That's Robert's rules. Next. That's Robert's rules. All right. So we're actually at the end of our uh, presentation. There was just one thing that I wanted to reiterate. Um, at the um, end was because it is in relation to our um, the annual work plans, which is your you know annual um, contribution or statement of goals and priorities that you submit to the city council. And I kind of already explained the how it um, relates to the other governing documents that we uh, utilize for the city. Um, in regards to the city budget that determines how we're going to use our money um, for the upcoming fiscal year, the strategic plan, which um, is broken down with the priorities, the goals, and the objectives for the upcoming year um, as they are uh, provided by each of the departments within the city um, and then submitted to the city council. Um, and then the annual work plans that come from the commissions so those annual work plans are then aligned with the strategic plan and then go up to the city council to be then provided a, a fiscal um, assignment um, to them as well. So just reiterating that last part, um, there's a lot more information in regards to the city departments and our structure and the way that it works um, within the city. Um, but if you have any questions um, on any of the information that's being provided to you, I'll have additional resources that I'll be sending out in my follow-up. Um, but that is the end of our presentation. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now. And here comes Maricela. She did a wonderful job tonight, didn't she? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so if I um, have something that I want to get put on the agenda, what, so I'm realizing there we don't have, I don't send an email to all the commissioners to, to talk about that. So if I did have something I wanted to put on the agenda, then I just send it to the city, uh, uh, the staff liaison and our clerk and ask them to put that on the agenda or do I send it to the chair or the vice chair? I would recommend you send that to um, your chair and your liaison, um, you know, jointly so that they can, as they formulate what's going to be on the agenda, 
um, they can take that into consideration to have it added and then so that it can be ready for a full discussion. And then your liaison will likely inquire if they need more details or more information about what you're looking for so they can explain that to the chair as well. Um, so that when the agenda is created, you know, there's no surprises for you who have submitted um, an item to be considered um, and also for your chair and, and your liaison as well. So for example, we, um, when we had our meeting, we uh, made a decision that as a, as a, as, as a commission, that um, we would allow the other commissions to um, present proposals to us. And if I have a proposal as a commissioner, you know, that I wanna to present to the commission, I have to then, what I would need to do is then contact the, the chair and send my proposal to the chair to be put on the agenda, right? That's what I would have to do? Correct. Did you understand it differently? No, I think that's the correct answer. You work with your chair and your liaison to get a matter on the agenda. I guess I would give you one um, little caveat, maybe. Um, remember when we talked about the charge of your committee or commission. So if you're trying to put something on a agenda that's not really in your committee's charge, that can be a problem and you could feel very frustrated. So hopefully your liaison will say to you, you know, that's outside of the charge of your commission. It's not, not an appropriate subject matter to bring before the commission. And I, I have heard of issues like that, but I think if you are prepared for your commission and you understand what your charge of your commission is, it will help reduce, um, potential frustrations that some might feel because they don't feel like they're being heard because you're trying to put something on an agenda that maybe is not appropriately discussed at that particular board or commission. Does that make sense? Well, I, it, you need to talk in the mic. Sorry. It, it's hard. It's hard to understand because, you know, it's, there's no time, there's no opportunity to talk about anything. It has to be on the agenda. You can't talk about it outside. You can't talk about it in, you know, any other time. So it's really confusing about how you can get things on the agenda that you think are important that are toward that are toward what your 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 yes that are part of your purview. For for example, you know, I, I just had an idea about you know we have this money we have to spend and we have to think about ideas about how we want to make improvements on our community. How am I supposed to get those forward? You so, know? Okay. That's a great question. I think that's a wonderful question on most of our agendas and Dominique, you correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there is usually something at the end that talks about new council member requests, for example, or staff reports or commissioner reports. That's the area where you bring those up and you you would the way you would do that is you would say under under commissioner comments you might say you know uh chair i'd really like to have this idea put on the next agenda for discussion so you can do it in your meeting what you can't do is you can't talk about your idea at that time, you can suggest the subject matter so that you can discuss it because, and do you know why that is? This is a te test question. Based on our instruction tonight, do you know why you can't talk about that? Because you didn't give them 24 hours or 72 hours notice to think about it. The public needs to have time to a whole bunch of arms. Let all these other arms have a the have brown or two. That's right. It is the Brown Act. Um, thank you. Um, my thinking is that why couldn't she attend other commissions meetings and bring those ideas to their attention, whatever commission it pertains to? And she could. 
So that would be um, that would be the instance in where you make a clear identification of how you are appearing towards that commission. So, you know, I'm Dominique Davis. I am not here in my capacity as city clerk or as city staff. I'm here as a resident of this community. And I'm here to talk to the Parks and Recs Commission about X, Y, and Z. And any other commissioner could do that same stance at any other commission or city council meeting. And just to further that, you, your commission might say, you know what, I'd really like you to attend the Parks and Rec Commission meeting for ideas. It, you, you might have a delegate, you might have an assignment to do that and to report back to your board or commission. You can do that. There are lots of different things that you can do. I just offered off up one way you might put it on the agenda for something specific. I think uh, Commissioner Maxwell over there gave his version of how you might skin the cat and um, not to offend PETA or anybody else. <laughs> but, you know, there are lots of things that you can do. There is actually some flexibility. And if you ever have any questions, I just encourage you to talk to your staff liaison. You can always talk to the city clerk and you can always call my office. What's your office number? <laughs> one, two, three, four. No, I'm five, 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 one, two, three, four. Yeah, seven, seven, three, four. No, <laughs> it's uh, eight, nine, nine, six, eight, nine, zero. One last question. So if we have a commissioner that does have personal questions while they're sitting up there, is it okay for them to do, as you said, if to, I guess, to come under public comment, to let themselves be known, I'm here as an individual, or how do we steer them away from that? Mm -hmm. Because I do have an individual on our commission that sometimes steers things very personal. And we try to allow for that speaking under the commissioner's reports. However, it seems to um, in, find its ways throughout the meeting. How do we address that? Hmm. That's a really great question. Do you want to adjourn to next Tuesday? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's 735. We need a motion to extend the meeting. No, I'm just uh, teasing. Well, I guess... There are a couple of different ways. Um, hopefully that person may have attended this training. So they hope- No, she's not here no, at all. No, she's not. <laughs> um, but second of all, if, if, you know, that might be a pull the commissioner aside and have a conversation um, first, maybe. Keeps happening. You know, it could be a point of order. Chair could do that. I mean, there, there's, again, some, some flexibility um, there, um, you, I've seen chairs call people, stop people from saying certain things, um, on, you know, when it starts to cross the line between public and personal. And it's, and again, it's a, it's a fine art. It's a, it's not, there's not a bright line there because part of your commission and your committee service as a, as a public member, you're bringing issues and talking about what's going on in the community. That's how we are getting some of our information and our recommendations, right? You're, I see a whole lot of people running yellow lights. That's a safety issue. That's my personal issue. I almost got taken out by a guy who ran a yellow light, right? I mean, it's a personal thing, but it's also a public thing. So that's why I'm saying it could be, it's a very fine line when you say they're talking about personal things and I, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have the, you know, it's, I don't have the context to be able to try to rein it, rein it in, but it would be if I was always saying, you know, we really should have public art right next to my house. And, you know, it's over there on, you know, upper Yosemite and da, 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 da. And, and then we go to item 10 C and I, oh yeah, it'd be really great to have it next to my house. You know, I mean, if there, it was something, well, it, really obvious like that, yeah, maybe. Yeah, um, I would pull that commissioner aside and just say, "Hey, you know what?" Um, and it could be that maybe that's the way that person expresses themselves. So I will say a lot of times, "I," 
I don't like the way something is happening. And I don't really mean me. I mean, I'm putting myself in, what would I do to protect the city? I, I, you know, but I say it as I, it's not really me, it's we, right? But it's just a way of thinking and a way of expressing yourself. So, you know, maybe a conversation would help. I don't know. And just staying very clear on what your charge is, you know, what your role is on the commission um, and understanding that at a commission meeting, you are a commissioner and making sure that you have that distinction and saving for any uh, personal effects for an appropriate avenue, which there are some that you would have in speaking with your liaison or, you know, voicing your opinion at another um, commission meeting where it may be more appropriate. Or even at the city council. Or even at the city council. Uh, thank you. Uh, I do, I understand your frustration. It feels like in these meetings, how can we get anything done? We just like can't talk about things. You have to make a motion. I, I wish I understood Robert's rules. I, it's a mystery to me. Um, but my question has to do with, is there some kind of calendar to help your commission understand when they need to be doing what? So you're not having, I think our, the budget was due June 1st. I think we met May 28th to do our budget. We didn't even get to look at it twice because we don't meet every month. And so the plan needed to be, if we wanted to look at it and finalize it, I mean, I tried to draw a diagram for myself. If we want a final vote in May, then we know um, if we're only meeting every other month, we have to have a plan to either do the budget in January so we can look at it at March so we can have and make adjustments and have a final vote in May, or we're gonna work on it in March and have our final vote in May. I mean, like you have to have these plans of, in order to hit this date, we have to start back on this date. And I thought I heard in, I'm sorry, I couldn't figure out the papers, but I thought there's this annual plan that we're supposed to start on. I'm assuming it's our first meeting after January 1st, because I thought you said in the new year, at the beginning of the year, but I'm not sure if it's January or the fiscal year, which year is it? And, and when is that dang thing due? And how many months in advance do we need to start working on it? Because it's every other month and we might want to look at it more than once. Is there some kind of calendar? I tried to build it in Lotus with a spreadsheet. I just really, I just couldn't do it. I just like, how are all these other commissions keeping track of to make this date, we got to start back here so we can look at it more than once. Is, is there something? Yes. Are we missing something? On yes. my commission. So typically your, your staff liaison and your commission administration will have the tools to build that type of timeline. I use something similar for, you know, staff and city council um, that maps out for the entire year um, when they're for staff, at least, you know, when their staff reports are due, when they're due to the city manager, when they have to be reviewed, when do we have the draft packet, when do we have a draft agenda, and when it gets published. And there's it is a it's a spreadsheet that I created, but your staff liaison and commission administration would be the ones that you would go to to request that type of information. And if they come to me, then I can definitely give them the resources that they need in order to do that. Um, because there is a lot to keep up with. Um, and that's one of the things that um, your chair and your your staff liaison your yeah your staff liaison would work together on to ensure that the commission stays on track because that is one of the um, uh, main um, responsibilities of the chair is to lead the charge of the commission. And so having a grasp on all of that, um, you know, but if that's something that's lacking that you feel would be helpful, then definitely go to your, your staff liaison. Right. And, and as a, well, and as a commission, I think you could probably request your staff li liaison to bring back a calendar of the primary actions and dates that things, you, I mean, you could talk about that on your very first meeting of the new fiscal year, just say, you know, we'd really like to talk about bringing back a calendar so we know what's so coming down the January pipe. Or no, you can do it anytime. Okay. Do it any anytime. All right. But when you say fiscal year, you mean starting in fiscal, fiscal year. Okay, so just city financing. Our fiscal year is July 1 to June 30th. The calendar year is January 1 to okay. December 31. But it's July 1 to June 30th. July 1 to June 30th. That's fiscal. Money, who knows? You know, 
It is what okay. it is. Go ahead. I just want to make a comment that a special meeting can be called as needed. So that could help to alleviate some of the problems that you mentioned. That's right. I have a question about vacancies. So what if uh, your commission is struggling because there's vacancies, e either uh, someone has to resign or there might be a leave of absence. So then you have to reschedule regular meetings to maybe two weeks out, three weeks out. You're not able to do the total number of meetings or you have to hold a special meeting or, or you show up and uh, someone got the date wrong. So then you, you don't have a quorum and you can't do any actual business. And we have let a staff liaison and, and the you know, uh, staff know that, uh, you know, what's the process of uh, filling these vacancies? Is there a way we can like ask for help? Could, oh, could you help us try and fill these vacancies? Yes, absolutely. So our the, the method that we use in order to fill vacancies is that we either have applications on file because they're kept for two years, or uh, we put in, typically we would put in an ad into the newspaper. We send that out in our email publications that we might have. Um, and word of mouth, you can recommend um, community members that may be interested in um, joining a commission to put in an application as well. Um, it's it's hard to, um, someone has to really have a desire to want to volunteer their time and effort um, into a commission. Um, so there's not really a lot of help in persuading someone to join um, who can't really commit the way that might be needed. Um, but we use as many avenues as we have. And if it becomes a chronic issue, then that is something that we can, um, you raise, you know, raise the issue that you need it escalated to your liaison, and we can, you know, talk to the mayor and see what other avenues might be available. If it's a matter of maybe that commission has too many seats, um, not enough that they can, you know, keep actually filled, so maybe it needs to be reduced from seven seats to five, so that it's easier for you to um, uh, attain obtain a quorum. Um, so there are those um, ways that, that if you need to escalate it or if it's becoming a chronic issue um, that you want to have resolved, then we can we have measures to to deal with it that way as well. Thank you. So I have three questions. One, is there seven? You said there's seven people on the commission. There's supposed to be seven vacant seven uh, positions. Each commission has a different set of possible seats. Some have nine, some have seven, some have five, some have three. Is the Nick seven? The Nick, hold on, determines. Just give me one second. The Neighborhood Improvement Commission. Yes. <laughs> and then my other question is, while you're looking that up, on the term limit. So our limits are three years. Are we able to renew our term or are we able to serve uh, successive uh, terms or, or no? And what's the limit on that? And the last thing is name tags. You talked about cards, but are we able to get name tags, um, you know, for when we're at a public function or something? You can make that request through your, your staff liaison um, for uh, name tags. Um, as far as your terms, um, they are they are automatically renewed unless you decide to um, resign um, from that commission. So you can serve for, we've had commissioners that served on a particular board of commission for you know, 20 plus years. So there's no term limit um, to that unless you have, you know, you're holding an incompatible office. Um, then that might be the case. As far as for the Neighborhood Improvement Commission, um, your um, ordinance has a commission um, shall consist of nine members um, that hold office for three years. Nine members? Okay. We're very short. Yeah. We only have six, I think. Thank you. You're very welcome. 
Are there any other questions? Thank you very much for your time. This has been great. Yeah, this is very great. Really. Awesome. All right. Well, we don't have any others online um, that have questions.